Hello, everybody. Welcome. Thank you for joining me. <laughs> I guess that's become kind of my standard introduction. found a box that's made of metal. It said lunchbox on it, but it's a little square box, and I was curious what was inside it. I wanted to, I'm, I'm a very curious person, um, and actually when my curiosity is leading my awareness, <clears throat> um, that tends to go pretty well for me. Uh, because if something else is leading my awareness, like anger or fear or anxiety or um, frustration, confusion, then my body changes. And of course, my mind changes, but... It's strange that we think of these two things, often anyway, we, we're inclined to think of them as separate. And in our time, you know, over the past few hundred years, uh, science has become very focused on the brain, cognition, thinking theories, ideas, models, concepts, experiments. And this is, you know, it's one way of pursuing questions, but I think what concerns me about this is the problem where it is supposed or implied that our brain is where our intelligence is. Our brain is where our mind is. It's all a bunch of brain things. And it's a wildly incomplete and very deceptive idea. Um, there's a scope of concerns in which it's relatively true, right? Uh, but for most of the history of life on Earth, there weren't any brains. From what I understand, for about six-sevenths of that history, no brains. <laughs> um, and the primary organ of knowing was probably the gut, although... One of the troubles we have with thinking and modeling and ideas is the single cause problem. What, where does thinking happen? Oh, it happens in the brain. Well, there never was a brain without all the other organs and cells and histories and bones and skin and hair and eyes and things. So this idea that, you know, our thinking happens in our brain, it's not entirely untrue, but it occurred to me earlier uh, that thinking is kind of the aftermath of many other activities and processes in the body, um, most of which we don't even have language about, probably the majority of which we've never discovered. Uh, our bodies, like our world, like other creatures and living places, they are relational hypersystems with many, many dimensions of 
embodiment, activity, process, transformation, um, digestion. And our bodies know things not in the sense of cognitive knowing, but our bodies are aware of all kinds of things that there's no language about, and they can't, you know, often by the time it becomes conscious, uh, we're already deeply confused. (laughs) And maybe even the important thing has passed, or, you know, what was being attended by the body has already past by the time it gets to consciousness. So this isn't the only thing that can happen, but thinking is almost like the poop of the body's digestion of knowledge. (laughs) And, you know, there's some astonishing things about poop. (laughs) Um, We have the trope in English, older than shit. I'm not sure there's anything much older than that uh, in terms of embodied stuff, but surely, I guess we mean before even there were organisms, there was whatever this older than shit thing we're thinking about is. But yeah, I mean, if you watch dogs, um, they're really interested in shit. And it's not an accident, and there's something deeply profound there that we should not be quick to dismiss and worthy of close attention and curiosity questions. And I was just thinking today about questing and how there are some few of my friends who deeply understand this for they've engaged directly in it. Uh, And we all have some understanding And I was thinking of the the relationship between questions and questing. And I like the sort of playful observation that the word question actually has the structure of quest I on. (laughs) I am on a quest. Um, The quest I am on is my question. And most of us come to human birth, maybe all of us, with quests already a part of our being. Human incarnation and all of incarnation is a staggeringly beautiful library of mysteries. But one of the quests that's common to children um, that may not be immediately obvious to everyone is to unify their parents and deepen that unity, to bless that unity, to enrich that unity, and also to remind the older people that the younger people are bringing new gifts to the world. They are, um, (laughs) in a sense, the updated version of humanity. Um, And there are great mysteries surrounding this that have to do with how we're connected throughout time. It's very clear to me that something in my child is a vehicle for my own development in the future of myself while yet I live. I was kind of waiting for those sirens because a little while ago, I guess maybe 10 minutes now, there was a sound like a very loud explosion. 
and I wondered what made that sound. And of course, I had pragmatic concerns. Are we safe? (laughs) Are other things going to be exploding? Is there poison in the air? Was it a tank of something? What happened? I don't know. (laughs) I don't know what happened. Or rather, my body had the experience, but my mind can't categorize it very well. I only know that was a really loud and unexpected sound. Was it in fact an explosion? That I'm not sure of. (laughs) And the idea of something being in fact (laughs) is also very problematical. Um, Usually to get to a fact we have to throw most of everything else away. Unless the fact is relatively simple, such as, ah, I just took a step with my right foot. Well, yeah, that's, you know, that was factual at the moment and continues to be relatively factual as I proceed in my walk. There are domains in which facts are more valuable and there are domains in which facts become misleading because they can easily disorient us the aspect of our consciousness that's concerned with language and models and theories and analysis and I don't wish to demonize that aspect At the same time, we have to be cautious. It's easy to get lost in the shadows. Of our bodies, capacities for what I sometimes refer to as active sensing. Now, There's some common experiences of active sensing in our daily lives. Um, The way we drive our cars or bicycles or other vehicles is a process that active sensing plays a big role in. When we are eating food, if we are not merely sort of chewing our way through the meal, we can have an experience of the active sensing of flavors and textures and consistencies and, you know, how much chewing is needed. Do we need to chew more or less? When we're walking, we have active sensing of our balance, but we may not be aware of it. When doing something like Tai Chi, now we have a much deeper active sensing of balance and other sensations. When we are chasing something with great passion and enthusiasm and curiosity or with great urgency, then we are much more inclined toward experiences of active sensing and awareness. And it's quite a different thing to be human in a situation where our active sensing faculties are awake than it is when they are not. Urgent passion to see and learn and understand from beyond language and concept to truly contact that with which we've become fascinated. To always continue to be deeply loyal to the origins of the questions that are most compelling for us. 
um, not so much in thought as in feeling. Why is there injustice? Why are our cultures broken? Why is language so dangerous? Why is it that our technologies appear to lead our species further and further away from any meaningful experience of communal humanity or communal being? These are words, these are verbal questions, but their origins aren't verbal. Now, many of us throughout our lives in various phases will be, um, just like in our daily life, we will go through experience where we're kind of on autopilot, so to speak, we're sort of zombied out, um, going through the motions, but not really present. And then we will have other experiences, hopefully, where we are very present and we wake up. And one of the reasons why trouble, suffering, confusion, and pain are important features of our human experience is because they at least have the propensity to penetrate um, the otherwise rather shallow awareness and attention that may have become our habit. Uh, my old Zen teacher, my first Zen teacher, who I have reverence for and respect for, John Tarrant Roshi, um, he's, he can often be found singing the praises of terrible difficulties, um, catastrophe in our lives, illness, death, injury, loss, suffering, confusion, pain. And part of the reason that he's singing those praises is that if we want to emerge from our sleepwalking, situations like these can be very helpful because they're inclined to render some of our ordinary habits transparent and we can then see through uh, the mess into something primordial. If we're paying attention. And so, you know, the people that learn with him and others like him um, they're rather ironically chasing something um, something like awakening or enlightenment or satori they're on a quest And many of them will spend thousands of hours in meditation, in pursuit, in the hope of a moment where suddenly the strange dream of our conscious existence shatters and we see through it to its original nature. And this language is problematic because, at least according to tradition, 
that nature is no nature at all. But it's not precisely nothing either. Um, it's a very difficult thing to talk meaningfully about. <clears throat> But I've always been a very curious person in both senses of the word. Unusual and passionately compelled to try to learn or see to be a little less wrong. <laughs> And that curiosity is a great gift, but it can be overcome in times of trial, isolation, illness, injury. Though sometimes those same experiences uh, lend a deeper sense. They awaken my active sensing. And when that happens, then I feel so much more alive and so much more myself. And sometimes when we're faced with grave difficulties, we will try to think our way through them. And that doesn't always fail, uh, but it rarely succeeds as resoundingly as insight, really deep, resonant insight. When suddenly we see, ah, I've had this upside down, I've had this backwards, I've been following the wrong trail. My compass was leading me away from what I'm actually needing. Many of our films and stories <clears throat> involve quests. Um, and most of us have some experience of questing in our lives. So for example, we will chase a skill, vocation, um, learning, often in a highly structured environment such as an academic environment. Um, but there's a reason why all these old myths and stories and even our modern films and such, at their core, there's a, people become compelled to pursue something and they may not even know what it is, but they feel the urgency and necessity of pursuit following. Tracking, hunting, gathering, learning. And when things are particularly difficult, we may need to form a different kind of mind than the one that we are used to in our daily lives. Or at least, we may need to introduce this ability to awaken this ability in ourselves the ability to quest. It's a very profound topic and we're all both similar in many ways and unique in many ways. <clears throat> but quests most often involve non-human participants, right? non-ordinary participants, um, divine beings, angels, demons, souls of our ancestors, 
souls of the world, living places, the animals, the insects, the fishes and birds, the plants and trees, the deserts and mountains. And some of those sound ordinary because they're physically embodied. Ah, there is a tree. <laughs> this one is a Brugamensia. <laughs> Um, but the fact that they're embodied does not render them entirely ordinary, for they are the appearances of ancient urgencies and relationships. And they are heroic. All of the living beings have a kind of innate heroism if we take this to mean passionate, actively aware engagement with life, its history and future. When I see the incredible heroism of a mother raccoon attempting to lead her playful, distractible, confused children through the cityscape at night by herself. Four kits or five kits, they have to do impossible things and cross streets and some will be killed by cars and some will be lost or trapped. Some will be poisoned or become sick and die. When I see her leading her children through the city on any given night. There is a heroism there beyond all possible thinking. It has nothing to do with models. I'd almost call it pure. The other morning, as I got up to go to Tai Chi practice, <clears throat> I saw a raccoon following very intently a scent trail. And because it was still early and I perhaps was not fully awake, <laughs> actually, I'm almost never fully awake. <laughs> I don't even know what it means to be fully awake. <laughs> but in this sense, I mean it in a kind of you know, trivial way. I was a bit confused. Um, Innately, my body knows, but my, my consciousness didn't register it immediately. That the raccoon in, in the city, it shouldn't be running around outside in the daytime. That's a bad situation. Especially that late in the morning. But that didn't occur to me. What I thought at first was, oh, raccoons can follow scent trails. And maybe in the brightness, um, she can depend better on what she smells than what she sees. But <clears throat> I hadn't really connected with the situation yet. I wasn't active sensing. And the moment that I switched over into the other kind of sensing and observed the raccoon, then I understood very explicitly, I felt, what was going on. And what was going on was that she had lost one of her, her kits in the night. And so she was risking great danger and had to leave the other kits back at the nest and trying to retrace their paths in hopes of discovering her lost kit. And the passion and intense, intensity and urgency with which she was pursuing this problem, this tragedy, that's the kind of passion and urgency and intensity that we can embody when we embark on a quest. And in a way, even when I'm not consciously committed, the branches of my history of questing for understanding and awareness for knowledge, 
for intelligence is always with me. Even when I'm frightened or confused or alone or injured or sick, the old questions are still alive. I carry them like feathers for the wings of my soul and my heart and my body and my mind. Now I encourage anyone who's listening to actually experiment with this if you haven't already and even if you have uh, perhaps you may be willing to play together and formulate a quest and pursue it in a non-ordinary way not merely pragmatically not merely step by step but by becoming the question (laughs) and it could be a very simple quest or it could be a very deep quest But when we embark on this path, old faculties and relationships light up. And when we're deprived of this, many of these faculties and aspects of our senses and interiority languish. Um, they, They kind of dry up. So one of the You know, a useful introduction would be to quest if one doesn't already have something in mind to pursue. Um, We can play. A long time ago, a poet friend of mine, George Albin, and I had this idea that we would get a map of the city and we would each throw a dart at the map And then for our adventure that night, we would go to where the dart landed. Now this is a kind of a playful quest because we don't even know what we're after. (laughs) But we're willing to break up our routine in a playful and magical way. And that's a very profound and important thing because we humans I think we're starving, particularly in our modern experience, for adventure. Now, of course, there are many people who are just fundamentally adventurous. (laughs) They're adventuring all the time. Or they've realized that they really adore who they become when they're deeply engaged in an adventure. But others of us can use, you know, it would be helpful. We need some sparks, right? Before we catch on fire. (laughs) And I'm kind of a big fan of uh, rescue mutual concern and kindness, helping. Sometimes that gets me in trouble. Um, (laughs) But to have the ability to help a being who is trapped or in crisis or injured or alone This seems to me a beautiful adventure and worthy of our attention, concern, investment, time and energy. Now, of course, we can't just go around rescuing everything. We have to pick something. (laughs) But sometimes something is presented to us. And in some cases, I've done well with that. And in others, I've done very poorly. I've made terrible mistakes in quests, um, and even when I feel committed to rescue. 
And we have to be willing to make some mistakes. And even some mistakes that can seem catastrophic. That's part of the adventure. None of us are perfect. We're all trying to learn and grow and understand. Alone and together. So it's okay. But I'd like to recommend that you experiment with questing, and it can be a very small quest. Sometimes, a long time ago, when I had to do something relatively, you know, tedious or ordinary, such as, I don't know, get a bottle of milk from the store, I would pretend that I was a secret agent and that I was carrying coded papers <laughs> that it was imperative I deliver to my allies and that everyone around me was engaged <laughs> either for or against <laughs> this process. And so I would <laughs> imagine an entire adventure between my front door and the store and my return that had little or nothing to do with what actually seemed to be going on. This is the beauty of imagination, and when we quest, it can become profoundly, uniquely intelligent if we're practiced at this or if it comes naturally to us. So I'd like to encourage each of you to formulate a quest, if you don't already have one, and even if you do, to understand that I recognize something deeply profound about this. But formulate a little quest or two and play at questing, especially with others. For most of the animals, and I was thinking particularly of a pod of dolphins, when they awaken together, they are on a grand and terrifying adventure, particularly today where they have to live with the constant threats and repercussions and toxicity of all the machines and poisons and nets and traps that humans make. So for them, every day is an adventure, a quest to learn and grow and keep each other alive. Um, there was a great French diver his name escapes me now, but he was a friend and competitor with the freediver Jacques Mayo, about whom the film The Big Blue was made. And I strongly recommend this film, though I'm not big on watching films. In any case, um, one day he'd been diving with his daughter and uh, <clears throat> I'm telling the story from memory. As they were getting ready to leave the water, a dolphin came to him and very urgently attempted to communicate to him that something was terribly wrong. And so he followed the dolphin down, and somewhere near where they'd been diving, another dolphin, probably his mate, was trapped in a mesh of netting and was drowning. And he quickly swam to the surface and told his daughter to grab a knife. And she did. And they dove down there and they cut the female out of the netting. She was nearly dead. And they carried her with her companion to the surface. 
or she blew out a bunch of blood and they bided with her until she seemed to be well enough to continue. And then both the dolphins came and touched their noses to the faces of the divers to thank them. He didn't know what was going to happen that day, but he was aware enough to understand when the dolphin needed his help because hands made nets and only hands that could manipulate knives could free his companion. If we're attentive, we'll discover that there are little quests all throughout the day in our relations with ourselves and other beings and living beings and living places and humans. But also if we're playful, we can formulate, we can play at questing like we did when we were children. <laughs> And if you watch children, you'll see that they're aware of this idea of questing. And they get together to do it together all the time. And frankly, if no one interrupted them, they'd probably just keep doing that. <laughs> the great questions of being are embodied within us all. If we can learn to remember and share and explore together, then perhaps we'll have a chance for deep and abiding insight, learning, fulfillment, joy, play, and liberation. Thank you for joining me, and good luck on your most beautiful quests. May they be blessed and successful. <laughs>